as we uh, continue just to look at uh, the story. One of the things, and we're going to transition uh, here in just a second to another myth. That uh, myth is the the myth of the religion perpetrated by uh, by Paul. But when the Prime Minister of Great Britain says, on behalf of the religion of Islam, he says that terrorism, he wants to protect people against terrorism that has taken more Muslim lives than any other religion. So Cameron's strategy here is to say that because Muslims die at a, at a much greater rate to terrorism than do non-Muslims, therefore Muslims are the victims of terrorism, therefore they cannot be the perpetrators of terrorism. That is his, uh, his logic. He's not smart enough or he's, he's being deceptive, sufficiently deceptive, not to make the connection that the reason that Muslims are the principal victims of terrorism is because they live in the midst of Muslims who are the primary perpetrators of terrorism. And yet, he would want people to believe that because Muslims are the victims of terrorism, they cannot be the perpetrators of terrorism. Uh, it well, is nonsense. <laughs> uh, it is absolutely, utterly, and completely uh, nonsense. I would like to uh, now, since we uh, we we promised that we were going to conclude our presentation of uh, of Habitat uh, Two, uh, uh, I'd like to continue uh, with it this morning. We had just. Um, reviewed the uh, the statement this is in Habitat uh, 2.5 uh, and it's interesting that of course uh, Paul cites Habitat uh, 2.4 uh, twice, one in, in Romans uh, 1.17 and the other in uh, Galatians 3.11. It's the reason why any time you take a statement out of context and you quote, even a, a portion of a statement out of context to, uh, to prove your point, you don't have a point worth proving. And here is a case where, where Paul took, took the last half, the, not even the last half, the last snippet of, uh, of Habachak, what we now consider to be Habachak 2.4, and there weren't verse uh, denotations here, took this a thought that Yahweh was presenting, which is that if that since he says, I am never going to alter my, uh, my responsibilities. I am never going to change my requirements for participating in the covenant. I am never going to renege on my personal responsibilities related to these things. And therefore, if you want to have a relationship with me, you need to trust and rely upon what I have established. And so Paul took the last part of that and changed it so salvation doesn't come from the Torah, it comes from faith, which is the antithesis of what God was saying. And then this is what God says following that, which of course uh, Paul uh, didn't quote, because his name is Shaul, and he doesn't want anyone to know this. Although I have a sense that the attitude being manifest by Shaul of quoting a snippet from the previous statement and uh, is is manifest in what is happening with uh, Cameron in the UK. Let me read this to you. We read it yesterday, and then I want to tell you what is actually transpiring here. Okay, so recognize Paul twice in his two foundational letters, Galatians and Romans, quoted the last part of the last statement that Yahweh made out of context, which directs our attention to this particular discussion where God said next, Moreover, because of the intoxicating spirit of the man of deceptive infidelity and treacherous betrayal, the fact that he is a high-minded moral failure, he will not rest, he will not find peace, nor will he live. Whomever is open to the broad path, the opportunistic, duplicitous, and improper way associated with Shaul. He and his soul are like the plague of death. And so those who are brought together by him, receiving him, will never be satisfied. They will never find contentment nor fulfillment. In other words, the promises of eternal life in heaven, not going to happen. And it spoke, speaks of all of them. Most every Gentile will gather together unto him. 
all of the people from different races and places. So, got to think about this for a moment. Here is Shaul, demon-possessed, knows he's being controlled by Satan himself. He is an ego that is uh, beyond measure. He is convinced, and he says it over and over again, that he is smarter than everybody else. He calls everybody else ignorant and irrational. All of his, his letters start out, you know, you're, why are you so ignorant? Why are you so irrational? Why are you morons? Don't you understand anything? Puts himself. Have I said. Oh, right. No, no. So think this for a minute. Here you've got this, this man who actually believes that he is infinitely smarter than anyone else. When you get someone that, that has that view of themselves, who, who views everyone else as a dunderhead, what they will do is toy with their audience. And that's what he's doing here. Well, it's, it's just like it's a just, drug addict. A drug addict is smarter than everybody else that they're manipulating. But, yeah, but, the th- but, think, but think about what's happening here. Just as Paul acknowledged that the goad that he was unable to rebel against in his conversion experience with Satan on the road to Damascus, just as in his second letter to the Corinthians, he acknowledges that that goad, that, that pointed stick in his side to control him, was that he was demon-possessed. And he realizes that, you know, my audience is so stupid. I am so spellbinding, they're never going to put that together. I can flaunt the truth right in their faces. It's pretty puffed up. And they're, and, and they're not going to get it. Here, Shaul, twice to make his point. This is, the, this is the pivotal point in Pauline doctrine, that the Torah cannot save, he says in Galatians. It is incapable of saving, and the proof of this is because of this passage which says that the righteous live by faith which is not what the passage says, but nonetheless, that's the pinnacle of Pauline doctrine. Well, the passage and, says the and, opposite is and, that and, I will but, never but, change. But, but, that's not, but that's not the point here. The point is, to prove his thesis, he deliberately took the statement one sentence away from the sentence that calls him out by name, that says that he is the plague of death, that he's intoxicating, that he's deceptive, that he's treacherous, that he's a high-minded failure, and that the broad path that he is recommending is like the plague of death. He, yeah, well, yeah, that's 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 so, writing right on the edge. That's calling so, the so audience what, stupid. You're so right. what? So when you look at Islam and you look at the testimony of of Allah through Muhammad, what you see is exactly the same thing. You have God, uh, this animosity, this Satan's animosity for God being so extreme. And you have Satan's ego being so extreme and his spirit having such disdain for humans that you recognize exactly the same thing. That, that Satan is inspiring Paul to say, in essence, God these people that uh, you seem to have so much interest in, that, that you have sacrificed so much for, these morons are so stupid. For example, in Islam, I'm going to name purity, pure food, pure behavior, halal, which is the name you gave to me, and they still won't figure it out. And here, through Paul, Satan, is saying, God, these people that you sacrifice so much for, that you seem so interested in, are so stupid. Let me show you how stupid they are. They're not worthy. I'm going to tell them that my messenger is demon-possessed. I'm going to have my guy quote from the very passage where he is exposed by name, where you condemn him, and they won't figure it out. That's how stupid they are. Why do you love them? Why do you care for these people? They aren't worthy. What it is, is it's the nature of an insecure spirit. Satan is insecure. He needs to put God down to lift himself up. He wants to put God's creation down so that he can lord over them. What this is, is, a, is Satan saying, God, your creation 
is stupid. I can admit that I'm manipulating everything. I can admit that my guy is a complete fraud. And they won't figure it out. They'll just go along. It's there the is no spirit. It's the same There spirit. is no denying here that God has said this treacherous man Gerber this individual human being that he is intoxicating that he is deceptive that he is treacherous and that he is the motivation for this broad path that this man's going to arise during the fulfillment of the Moed that he is egotistical beyond belief. And that his name is Shaul. And, you know, can, can I throw something in here, Yana? And, but, yeah, I mean, what, what did uh, Shaul say he, he, that uh, the, the flashing light that he met on the way to Damascus, what did that flashing light call him according to Shaul as he is testifying to, uh, to Luke? What did it call him? What name did that spirit use? Um, not Shaul. Shaul, Shaul. Oh, well, Shaul, read, yeah, that was his name. Read, sure. read, the, read the book of Acts. It doesn't say Paulos, Paulos. It says Shaul, yeah. It says Shaul, Shaul. And, and can I throw something in here? Yahweh has, because Yahweh sees the future and, and knows the future, he has a way of digging back in the same way. You know, he says, right, the very next line says, so they do not ask questions, any of them, about him. Now, yeah. what does Sheol mean? What does his name mean? Question him. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it means. It means, it means, it means question him. That's yeah, what his he name right means. Right back, didn't he? Oh, yeah. Right back. Yeah, here's, so here's don't the... Don't ask any, any questions. So here's, here's God's identified, the founder of the Christian religion, the man who negated everything that Yahweh had said, everything that Yahusha had had done and yet claimed to speak on behalf of God to annul everything that God had stood for. In fact, his quotation of Habakkuk 2.4 was specifically designed to say the Torah cannot save. What you need instead is to be saved by faith and to believe me. And the next line out of God is to identify the perpetrator of this 600 years before he would write that by name, saying that he was treacherous, that saying that what he wrote was the plague of death. And now, when we return to Shattering Mist, we are going to find that God even said, why don't you question him? Welcome back to Shattering Mist. We're considering Habakkuk 2, which is uh, one of the most profound prophecies in, uh, in all of the Torah prophets and Psalms. Uh, if uh, you're a Christian and you have not read it, then I would... Uh, Strongly encourage you to uh, to read it. The uh, difficulty for you, of course, in trying to read it is that your uh, English translations are are uh, make a mockery of the actual uh, text. So you really need an interlinear and a lexicon to uh, to read through it. Uh, Larry mentioned yesterday one of the uh, the translation uh, corruptions is that the Masoretes uh, ended up uh, pointing uh, the uh, Shen uh, Ain uh, Wa. Uh, Lamed, Shaul, they ended up uh, pointing it as Sheol as opposed to Shaul. They're identical in the Hebrew text. Uh, and so you have now a man associated with, uh, with uh, Sheol when Sheol is a place and Gerber speaks specifically of a man and all of the, the uh, pronouns were, were uh, regarding him third person, masculine, uh, singular. This is an individual. It even says in the next line, after Shaul, he and his soul. So after calling him a man, which is not a place, it says he, the pronoun he, as in who, which is uh, third person, uh, uh, singular, masculine, and his soul, his nephesh, are like the plague of death. Uh, it is... Uh, it is impossible to make the claim that God is speaking of anyone other than this singular individual. The, you can't be talking about a waiting place. Right. And, and Paul is the single most devastating individual to ever lived. If you were to list all of the people that God would be concerned about in human history, the single most destructive is Shaul, Paul. And the reason I say that is, is because what Shaul did is 
he negated everything that Yahweh had said and done, made everything that Yahweh had said and done meaningless, and, and replaced that with uh, this transition to the gospel of grace, and thereby led more people astray and away from God than anyone who has ever lived. No one has been responsible for the death of more souls than Paul. And so, of all of the people that God could have called out by name to, to issue a prophecy about saying that, that he is a plague of death, and no one will be satisfied who uh, flocks to him. Of all the people that, that Yahweh could have called out to identify this way, the man known as Paul, because that's his chosen name, his real name is Shaul, was the worst in human history. No one even compares. And if you look at Muhammad, the, the reason that God would not, although he has a lot to say about Islam, but the reason that God would never bother to identify Muhammad is, is twofold. One is Muhammad was not a Jew. Not, it, 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 Muhammad never claimed to speak on behalf of Yahweh. And second, that Muhammad's mantra is so astonishingly stupid that you have to be a complete and utter moron to be a Muslim. You have to be ignorant and irrational. Now, while it's true that you also have to be ignorant and irrational to be a Christian, Paul's ploy was much more clever. Now, it's obvious that he lied, but it isn't obvious until you open your mind to the possibility that he lied. And the fact that, that Paul's letters are incorporated in the, along with the eyewitness and historical text of Yosha's fulfillment of the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, makes Paul especially deadly. And yet God says, they do not ask questions, any of them, about him. Terse references to the word they lift up as taunts to ridicule. And I received an email, which I'll address, uh, I've addressed part of it already, and I'll address the second part of it in future shows, where people just take little snippets out of context, just like Paul did, I mean, Paul's whole concept is, I'm going to take a part of a statement out of context to mock and ridicule God. That's the basis of his argument. And when you confront Christians with the truth, they do the same thing. They don't ask questions, any of them, about him. Terse references to the word. Terse means snippets, you know, uh, truncated, out of context, removed from the discussion. Small segments, isolated. Which is exactly what he did in Romans and also the other. What, and, what, and what Christians do every time they try to defend him. Right. And, they and, lift and yet Yahweh points him out. He, he, just, he, he, he says this is the tactic he's going to use. And right. the exact tactic he used is right here in Abijah. And, and everyone and all these Gentiles who follow him, they use exactly this strategy to defend him. Yep. They lift up as taunts to ridicule, along with elusive sayings with derisive words. You know, when you say that the Torah is outdated, that it's a system that has been replaced, that it's incompetent, that the God of that system is impotent, that, that his teaching enslaves, and that it can't save anyone, are you not using derisive words to taunt and ridicule God? Welcome back to Shattering Mist. We're talking about the prophecy that uh, Yahweh uh, shared with us 600 years before uh, Paul would perpetrate the greatest fraud in human history uh, by creating the religion of Christianity, a religion so synonymous with faith, it refers to itself as a faith. Uh, people use faith and religion uh, when they are Christians uh, as if the concepts were synonymous, all as a direct relationship to uh, what Paul has said and done. And God of him, after naming him, says they do not ask questions, any of them, about him. And that's true. I mean, universally, you cannot get a Christian to question Paul. The moment you even mention that you need to question Paul, his name means question him, God told you to question him, they get defensive and none of them will. They say, oh boy, it's the word of God, you can't, you can't pick and choose. 
Not, not the word that. of God. Not a, the, the, the way Paul's letters got put into any book and the concept of a New Testament was by Marcion, who just simply hated the Jews. A wealthy shipbuilder who had... Who, who was the son of a bishop who had yep. the marketplace flooded with Paul's letters and then he put a book together called a New Testament where yep. his first New Testament was only Paul's letters and Paul's yep. historian Luke. That's it. So a yep. man yep. made that concept yep. up and took Paul's letters and by yep. the way said he was the only apostle and the rest of them were worthless. Yeah. Well, you know, and I used to, uh, and I have actually written that Marcion is responsible for doing that. I was mistaken. It, it, everything you just said about Marcion is true. Oh yeah. That doesn't, it doesn't change. It doesn't change the fact that I was mistaken. Okay. And the reason so I was, uh, what, let, me, let me tell you how I was mistaken. Now, it, again, everything you just said, which you've cited the research that I've done, is is accurate. Everything you just said is true, and yet I was mistaken. Because what I what that infers is that Marcion is responsible for the concept of a new and old testament. That infers that, uh, that is. Is, uh, yeah. absolutely when you when you actually translate thoroughly, accurately, completely, Paul's opening line, for example, in um, in Galatians. What Paul says is that I'm here to annul the pornographic old system. Yeah, he, he he has he has his own terminology that he uses through his letter to specifically identify the Torah as the old system, and then Paul introduces his new testament, and so well, the concept of an that old and new true. testament is that's based true. solely on Paul. Well, what and he so, was created and Paul, a religion based on the life and times of Aiesus. Right. <laughs> yes, and also what Paul claims is that Paul claims that he's the only legitimate apostle. He de- right. delegitimizes the others. So while Marcion indeed ran with that ball, and because of his money was able to flood the market with, with manuscripts uh, attesting to uh, to Paul's replacement, the fact is that all Marcion did was run with the ball that Paul gave him. Paul made all of those claims. He had, we, have, we, have no one, we have no one to blame but Paul. Now, the fact is that when you start promoting liars like this, then you are amongst those that God is, is, uh, is calling idiots for doing so. He says they don't ask questions about him. Terse references from the word they lift his taunts to ridicule along with elusive sayings with derisive Words, mocking interpretations, wrapped in an enigma, are arrogantly spoken, God says. There are hard and perplexing questions that need to be asked of him. Now, I'm here to tell you, it took me until I was in my 50s before I asked these hard and perplexing questions. And the moment you are willing to question him, the moment you ask these hard and perplexing questions, it all unravels. Every bit of Paul's foibles and ploy and strategy and lies it all unravels before your eyes, and you're freed of this man's lifeless deception, his plague of death. There are hard and perplexing questions that need to be asked of him, and they should say, woe to the one who claims to be great and who increases his offspring, neither of which apply to him. Now, what is God saying there? Well, so, uh, first, you know, Paul uh, said that he finished the Messiah's work. He right. essentially called himself the Messiah. And, so, he, and, he, and he called the, his believers, those who believed him, his offspring. His offspring is, the, is Christianity. It is all the souls that have been beguiled and destroyed by Christianity. He claims them as his offspring, and he claims to be great, constantly telling us how great he is in the eyes of God. How great a messenger is, how the world was given to him, how indeed he is the co presenting himself as the co-savior. He even presents himself as the co-author of scripture. And yet, God says, neither of those apply to him. He has nothing to do with the covenant's offspring. Doesn't apply to him, and he's not great. He is indeed lowly and little. For how long? Will they make pledges based upon his significance? Paul claimed to be the most significant character in human history. How long will they make pledges? Their vows to faith, their, their acceptance of the gift of grace, 
How long will they make pledges, their promises, their oaths, their acceptance of salvation through faith in the gospel of grace? How long will they make pledges based upon his significance? And he loads himself down with thick mud, God is saying. This is murk. All you're doing is covering yourself up with that which is dark and wicked, with dirt and dust to be swept away. Why not, quickly, for a short period of time, rise up and take a stand, he's asking us. And those of you who are bitten and are making payments uh, to him, wake up from your stupor. I think... <laughs> Move away in fear of him. Yep. Because you will be considered plunder, victimized by them. Didn't, so God didn't, said, didn't I, Christianity I mean, bring about 1,400 years of the Inquisition? Uh, of course, but God, God is saying that, that, he's, that the person who makes these pledges based upon the significance of Paul and his contribution to this alleged New Testament, they're saying all you're doing is covering yourself with filth. Yep. He said, you're, you're loading yourself down with this dark and wicked muck. And he tells us you know, to take a stand, doesn't he? Right. Take a stand. Be opposed to him. Yeah. And those of you who are bitten, making payments to him, how many people have donated money to Christianity? Billions. Well, billions. the world's been robbed by the Vatican. They're the wealthiest got, organization so, in the world. As far as I'm concerned... And you and I may disagree on this. I think the Jesuits are in charge. I think they yeah, run it all. No, I don't. But but I do. The fact that <laughs> okay, well, you're in, that's I'm your well opinion. I, no, no, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're they're not that smart. Yeah. And those of you who are bitten making payments to him to this religion, to all of Christianity, whether it be an Orthodox, you know, Greek Orthodox, or the Copts, or Roman Catholicism or Protestant Christianity and all of its derivatives, all of which came from the poison pen of Paul. Why are you making payments? Why are you donating money? Do you think that your donations are somehow pleasing God, that they're going to they're be on the scale of, of you being able to enter heaven because you uh, gave him your tithes and your offerings? He's saying, wake up from your stupor. Move away. Be afraid of him. Abhor and be terrified of his vexing nature. It's a plague of death. Just as you would be afraid of, of walking up and exchanging blood with, a, uh, with an, an AIDS patient. Just as you should be afraid of wallowing in the blood of, an, uh, of a victim of Ebola. Just as you should be afraid of, of lapping up sarin. You ought to be afraid of the most deadly thing in, the most deadly toxin probably in all of human history. The broad path, the plague of death, that is the sum and substance of Paul's letters. Take a stand against him. Those who are bitten by him, wake up from your stupor. Move away from him. Dread him. Abhor him. Be terrified of his vexing nature. Because you will be considered plunder. You'll be victimized by them. God is saying, you know, if, if you're going to play the role of Christian, if you're going to buy into his faith, you're going to be victimized from him. There's not going to be any satisfaction. I'm, I'm warning you in advance. You're going to be victimized. You're going to die. You'll be plundered. Then he goes on to say, because you have plundered, stealing the possessions of so many Gentiles, speaking of Paul, you have plundered, stealing the possession of so many Gentiles. One of the things that's, that's ubiquitous about Paul's letters is he's constantly pleading for money, saying that, you know, that if you're going to be a Christian, you need to support uh, the leaders. You need to support me. You've got to send us your money because you have plundered, stealing the possession of so many Gentiles. So they will loot and victimize all of the remaining nations. Mm. Those, those you plundered will continue to plunder. By means of the blood of humankind, and also through the violent and cruel destructive forces terrorizing the land and Yah's city, and all of those living in her. What have Christians done? 
related to the promised land. They've terrorized it. They've waged wars in it. What is the most deadly and bloody, bloody doctrine in human history? Religion. What's the, been the most bloody and deadly in human history? Christianity. Probably. Oh, yeah, sure. Christianity. Yeah, that's right. So you've plundered, you plundered your original victims, and they've gone out and plundered more Gentiles, and they've looted all of humankind, and there is nothing but a river of blood that rolls out from beneath your feet. That's what God is saying here. Woe to the one who is cut off, coveting. What did Paul say over and over again in his letters that his covetousness was out of control? He says in Romans 7 that he was a lustful libertine, that his ability to control his lusts and his covetousness was beyond measure. Now, he blames it on the Torah. He says, I wouldn't have even known what it, what it was to be lustful and covetousness. I wouldn't have known these things if it wasn't for the the Torah. And so I blame the fact that I'm an uncontrolled libertine, that I'm a sexual pervert, that I'm greedy beyond imagination. I blame it all on the Torah, Paul wrote in, uh, in Romans 7. It's one of the most despicable arguments ever perpetrated by any human. Woe to the one who is cut off coveting while wickedly soliciting ill-gotten gain in relation to him setting his house and temple in association with the heights of heaven so as to spare the acquired property and possessions from the paws of his fellow countrymen he said he was a thief covetedness just as Paul himself admitted <laughs> To Shattering Mist, we're considering Yahweh's testimony in, uh, in Habachak. Uh, this statement is the next that follows. It says, you have deliberately placed and decided upon, and you have conspired at the advice of another. So you have deliberately decided upon and conspired at the advice of another. He's speaking of Shaul now, the person that he's named. So he says that Shaul has deliberately decided and conspired at the advice of another to promote a shameful plot to confuse. Those who approach your house, ruining and reducing by cutting off many people from different races and places, Goyim, and in the process, losing your own soul. Now, God has named this man by name. He has spoken of all the characteristics and tactics that Paul, the author of uh, the 13 letters, would use to create the religion of Christianity. And here he says that he deliberately did this. Now, that's, that's an eye-opener because it says that there is a 0% possibility that Paul could have thought that the individual that he met on the road to Damascus was actually God as opposed to Satan. It says no. He deliberately did this. He perpetrated this scheme deliberately. It's a shameful plot, and he did it purposefully. And, now, there's, this, only, and there's only one person, and, and he was around during the, the fulfillment of the Moed, so when the sacrifice right. was made, and he, there's people from different races and places all over the world that follow him. Okay. Right. I, I no, there's no, okay. There's no question that this is Paul. But here's here are there's three things that are said in this statement by using Yaatz Bosheth. The three things that are are important to know for those saying, well, maybe Paul was just misguided and he really thought that he met with God on the road to Damascus and he really thought he was telling the truth. What God is saying, no, he's deliberately decided to do this. Yeah, that this, that this, right. The second aspect is it's a shameful plot. That it was a scheme that he deliberately decided to, to promote. But who was he conspiring at the advice of another? He said he, he conspired at the advice of another to promote this shameful plot. That. I do not know. I don't get that. I don't get that. Oh. Who, who was he talking with besides Satan? That's exactly yeah. who he was talking about. He says, I'm okay. demon-possessed. Satan Satan there's controls no me. I'm being prodded by Satan. Yeah, because there's no person involved there. No, there's no person. It's Satan. Okay. Paul admits it's Satan. Satan admits it's Satan. 
and he even says advice of another. He doesn't say another man, does he? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I was always pretty accurate the way he's laying uh, down his words. He, yeah. <laughs> Woe to the one who provides, causes, and allows his neighbors, his companions, and his countrymen to drink this intoxicating brew, and thereby associating them with the venomous wrath, but also making them drunk for the purpose of observing their genitals. Now, who do we know that purposefully had a, deliberately by his own acknowledgement, had a fascination with the genitals of men? Paul? That would be Paul. Yeah. yeah. Not only does he speak vociferously in his animosity to circumcision, the one person he calls out by name to says he loves that he sent two personal love letters to, yeah. Is the one man? And all that. Yeah, the one that he uh, he yeah, personally he personally played with his genitals to circumcise him as an adult, Timothy. Yeah, young Timmy. Yeah. So he has all of this. He says is for the purpose of observing their genitals. That Paul did in fact have a perversion. He was homosexual. That was that is what you read even in Paul's own testimony in Romans seven, where he says, you know, that that his sexuality is perverted, and that that everything that the Torah says you ought not to do, Paul says the Torah is responsible for him doing, including if you're a man, don't lie with another man. So Paul is admitting that he's a sexual pervert in Romans. And God is saying, yeah, yeah, that's sexual pervert. Now, the reason that God speaks of the fascination with the male genitalia is because one of the things that you come to know about Paul is if you compare what we read about Paul with all of the statements that Yahweh and Yahusha make about the Torahless one, the one who is uh, called the Antichrist by Christians, but he's the Torahless one, mm -hmm. yeah. they apply to Paul. Yeah, there is no Antichrist written in right. any action. But, but Paul is that individual. Now, whether or not Paul is the anti masaya the Torahless one, and all, or just the living embodiment of what he will be like, that's an interesting story. But the fact of the matter is, there is no difference between Paul and the presentation of the Antichrist. We'll be with you tomorrow.